This is a hugely ambitious set of global goals to 2030. That's 12 years off. That's a really urgent time frame that, that we have, less than 12 years. And it's apparent that due to the huge investment gap, the SDGs are unachievable without significant input of the private sector. The public sector on its own can't achieve this. The private sector is needed because it has the money that it's needed for achieving those SDGs. And I want to start with Sarah, because you know, in your role at the Global Innovation Fund, you're trying to bring a venture capital type approach to achieving the sustainable development goals or achieving certain of them. Sure. And I'd like you to explain really a little bit about what it means to use a public-private partnership to achieve that and how you hope to invest to, uh, to meet the SDGs. Sure, Th thank you very much. Um, so let me just sort of contextualize, uh, tell you a little bit about uh, the Global Innovation Fund. Um, we were set up with aid money from developed countries to invest in the poorest uh, areas of the world with innovative ideas that sort of change the way we think of the, the doing business uh, in economic development and approaching economic development. So, you know, like Sam said, it's, it's a venture capital approach, but very much focused on uh, find, using evidence-based models and uh, looking very uh, intensely at the evidence of what's worked and what hasn't worked in the past, and then finding uh, solutions. What uh, we're a, a unique hybrid um, in this area because we are using uh, grant money from the developing uh, countries, many of them the, the UK, the US, Sweden, Canada, Australia, and others. Um, to, to really look at sort of what have been the market failures in economic development and trying to fill those market failure gaps. So to that point, uh, you know, we were really set up to uh, try to, to, to identify the most promising solutions that will reach the world's poorest to look at creative ways to invest in them which then our goal is to crowd in other types of capital. So that is, um, that is uh, you know, pri private capital and, or even development finance capital. And how is it that you identify, that you select those, right. uh, those gaps? Yeah, so we, we are in-house um, also a hybrid team of, economic development specialists who have deep, you know, decades of experience in, uh, in the field um, from, you know, the World Bank and governments, et cetera. And we combine that with uh, people like me who've got sort of private equity, venture capital, you know, investment experiences because our colleagues help us identify what's worked, the challenge, you know, we'll see opportunities and, you know, we'll, they'll help us figure out what's worked, what hasn't worked, why it's worked, uh, why it hasn't worked. And so when we look at an opportunity, we're, we're very much baking into it uh, a view of what we need to see as evidence going forward to invest. And we're looking like, others for scalable innovations, right? So, um, you know, so that what we do, we have an open window, people can apply through the open window um, for our capital. We also go out and uh, quite intensely and look for opportunities and we have very close, because we have, our funders are the government, we have very close relationships with governments and partners across uh, the markets that we invest in, which are primarily um, Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and Southeast Asia. And I can give a few examples if you want now or about the way we invest now or if you want to... Well, I'll, I'll bring in Ricardo for a yes, moment. I mean, Ricardo, you're a project management expert. You, in your role at the UN, were in charge of making sure that operations delivered, be it removal of chemical weapons in Syria, the building of refugee camps. Now with Brightline, you're talking about project management. So the question for you really is once you've identified those 
investments that are needed, how do you make sure that, A, that, that those development initiatives actually deliver, that they actually achieve what they're setting out to? Okay, thank you, Sam. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and uh, I, I operate basically on the opposite side and, and okay. trying because, uh, of course, funding is a critical thing when we are trying to implement the SDGs. But there is a lot of things going on in the field that must be in place in order to deliver the results we aim and also to increase the, uh, I would say, the, the interest for private sector to join this kind of efforts. Uh, and uh, basically, most of you have never heard about Brightline, but Brightline is not a business, it's not a company, it's an initiative. And it's a non-commercial, not-for-profit initiative trying to sponsor and get awareness on this gap. And go into your question. So when you take ideas or take funding or taking a business plan to transform into, into reality, you need more than money. So there is a lot of things that you need to be aware to get things done. And it's human-based. For example, when you are working in sub-Saharan uh, uh, countries in this, how do you engage the national government, the national entities, the national players to do that. Because at the end, when your implementation comes to an end, someone needs to inherit that and, and keep that uh, going. The second, you need to understand also how the volatility plays a role. Because we live in a, such a changing environment that things change dramatically. For example, when you approve a fund in, in a different country and for example, a conflict may arise suddenly, and this shift completely the priority of the international community right. under that specific neighborhood. So all this awareness, so we just published, uh, we published last year a set of principles that we believe that organizations would bring forward. And one of them, uh, for me, it's key, it's that you need to understand that the execution side is as important as the design. So uh, take Putting things on paper has a lot of value, but take it out of the paper is where the benefit comes. And, and I want just to give you a couple of examples, but one of them that is critical for me is, for example, when you build a maternity clinic, the maternity clinic is nothing until babies were delivered there. So uh, the money, everything you do in between becomes irrelevant because you only deliver benefit when you really finish that endeavor. And, and if we see the massive amount of money that is just destroyed on, on this journey, and this is exactly what we need to minimize. And this is exactly why Brightline exists today. So these initiatives, these partnerships don't really mean anything if they don't deliver. Yep. But what then are the biggest challenges to delivery? What, what are the biggest obstacles that you find projects face in actually Achieving them. Uh, yeah, yeah, I can give you some very quick. First one is senior leadership commitment. Commitment to execution. It's not commitment just with the plan. Accountability. So people need, and, and let me use, please, I, I love to use this example. So when you vote to, for someone as an officer or as a governor or a president, you are voting in a plan. Right? You vote because you believe that that person is able, has good ideas, and will be able in four years, five years, whatever, to deliver that. But what happened at the end? So when this person gets elected, there is very few accountability on that. Because you cannot say, come one year later and say, look, I voted for you, but you didn't deliver what I'm, I was planning. Now I want to remove my vote for you. So it's a different and it's very tricky. So this is what we see many times. You don't have this accountability on delivering the end result because end result takes time. 12 years from now, who will be there, right? How do you assure democratic accountability and transparency in a public-private partnership? This, I think, is what it comes to the heart of the, often the critique of the PPP model yep. is that you have, uh, you have an eroding of transparency and accountability when the private sector comes in. So how do you keep hold of that? Uh, just, I want to answer that and I want to just pick up on a couple of examples of how this sort of implementation and accountability is absolutely critical and why um, a public-private partnership approach that sort of takes a venture capital view uh, of looking at these investments 
actually solves for some of these, obviously not all of them. But the first is that, you know, we're not going to make an investment without a local entrepreneur who's leading that investment. So that local entrepreneur, you know, so much of our due diligence is actually looking at the, the who's running it. Can they implement? Do they have the right team? Or do they have the relationships with government and others and civil society that matter? And because we have public money and public trust that we're investing, we take that due diligence extremely seriously. So sometimes to the point where our investees just get very frustrated, but at the end of, the, at the end of it, they say, thank you very much because you've prepared us now for getting private capital, right? So we've gotten them kind of to this. The other thing is that it's really critical for us to take an active position, um, you know, with with our investees, and that is to sit on the board or sit on sit in as as an observer, so that uh, we can make sure that they remain committed, sort of, to impact. Let me just give you an example on that. We just uh, made an investment, a small investment from a large round in an Indonesian company. Um, that it's called Online Pajak, and they facilitate SMEs paying their taxes uh, to the Indonesian government, which is the source of additional tax revenue, therefore, for the government, and then flows down to the poorest. And we, we went into the deal with two major names in the private equity venture capital world, Warburg, Pincus, and Sequoia. And so on, uh, why, why is Global Innovation Fund going into this deal? Well, the company's going to make money by putting, you know, um, uh, all the other layer. They've, they're embedded in SMEs, and they're going to put all the other layers onto it, whether it's payroll and, and, you know, healthcare and all these other things onto the platform. But the critical part of the model is the relationship with the Indonesian tax office, yeah. right? So they asked us to come in because we represent sort of the public view, the assurance, the relationships with the government that, um, that will help make this successful for both, both sides of it. We want the company to make money, right? We want that, dis we like the discipline of those private players coming in, but it means nothing unless the uh, Indonesian government, you know, tax, ta tax revenue goes up. So. And on the other side, how do you incentivize those private players to enter once you've, you've identified that, that need? So I'll, I'll, I'll answer this one through another um, a portfolio company example. We have an investment in um, a company called Babangona, which operates in three states in northern Nigeria, and it's an agricultural services uh, company that uh, it's like an extension model, but it's really a, a, a holistic model. They provide the, the inputs, they develop cooperatives, they make, try to increase the profit for the, um, the, the farmers. And it, it, it had been quite successful and it was looking to, get, to take on some debt. It's a very capital intensive business. Um, and nobody would lend in the era. They only wanted to lend in dollars. Right? Even the development banks, we talk about these uh, DFIs, the development finance institutions, the, uh, they, w they are risk averse and they do not want to invest in local currency, which is one of the yeah. problems of execution and where a lot also fails. So actually we decided we would come in and we actually gave uh, a loan in Nayara, which, which then basically de-risked it and we came in in a subordinated position, de-risked it so that the development finance institutions would, would come in. And uh, I, that's our way, that's a sort of public-private partnership where our role is to de-risk, carefully select and that you know the 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 uh the companies and then find a way to de-risk it we want our money back too if we can but you know and, and crowd in that other capital yeah. uh, I'm, I'm interested in this de-risking i mean maybe ricardo you can take this up i mean how and when do you decide to de-risk a project and at what stage yeah, uh, i think that one one of the critical aspects when you think about pro public and private partnership is that uh, the two entities, they need to understand each other. So, and, and they need to understand that the government plays a major role on de-risking finance and also making the contact through the government 
uh, making the life easier for the project to be implemented in a more challenging environment. On the other side, the government needs to understand that private sector aims money, and the money can be also in a responsible way. So, and, and what I see based on my experience uh, is that, uh, because I was on the private and on the public, is that sometimes the public sector see profit at something bad, you know, that's something that we cannot mix because they are making money on the top of our investment. Right. And then the others see the government as slow, as bureaucratic. So, but if you want to fulfill the SDGs, there is no way, there is no money and there is no arm in the government that is able to do that. We need a widely support from private sector to do that. And how you this risk? It's building a trust relationship where the government plays its role in supporting. For example, many times investors, they have the money, they have the drive, but for example, they don't have access to the government to do things and they feel insecure on that neighborhood because something may happen and for example the government may change directions but by being partner with the government the chances that this happens is reduced this is a way of the risk in a project when you have an institutional support for example from a government or for a un entity or from a big a foundation so you have this this power to make things happen. So this is one way you reduce the risk. The, can I just add something to that? So the, the, you know, there's another way for, I mean, for, for companies who are interested in doing the right thing, right, within the context of their profit-making entities, et cetera, you know, y there is a question around, do you buy, or, you know, do you buy, do you build, do you partner, right? Mm -hmm. So. Some are building their own initiatives to achieve this and they've got to figure out how to do it and have those relationships and pick smartly and not get caught up into any corruption issues and you can obviously go down the litany of challenges. Um, some will just sort of acquire another firm that's already doing it and then some, so we're like go the partnership model. So talk about these partnerships. For example, Unilever um, recently announced a partnership with the Global Innovation Fund, which is, we call it the Advanced Fund, and they've given us some grant capital that's very focused on achieving, you know, they see it in the framework of what their contribution is to the SDGs. This is the framework in which it's set up. And they work with a, another partner in the UK for very, very risky super, super risky early stage investments. And then they've come to us and we've found others to match the capital. Um, and, you know, we're helping to deploy their capital. They trust us um, because they know we're leading with evidence, that we're really interested in the evidence of the impact. And we're going to go s give smaller amounts of money until we determine that the success rate and the bet on, on having a potentially dramatic impact um, is there, and then we'll find follow-on sources, and they themselves may then invest in this or buy, right? So there's this sort of, we're kind of a partner in the deploying their capital, but they're really trusting us to be smart, measured, and they know that because of our government backing, Yep. Although we're an independent entity, we're not controlled by governments, but we're, you know, government backing, we're going to be careful stewards, um, you know, of, of not just the capital, but the, the, all the challenges that go around investing to make the lives of the world's poor better. So we're talking about the selection of different sorts of models and different ways and instruments of going about achieving these sorts of partnerships. Does one also determine what sorts of instruments you use according to the different sorts of SDGs you're trying to address? I mean, um, I wonder, Ricardo, if, you know, if you're working on <coughs> gender, for example, if there are different ways that you might, and different models that you might want to employ, particularly to achieve greater um, gender equality or investments, or indeed if you're aiming at zero hunger or sustainable energy for all. Yeah. And, and this drives me, yeah, this question is perfect because uh, if we see the SDGs, um, they are super nice and they are super big. And if we can implement, we are solving probably all the problems we have today. And just by saying that, um, 
you, you already think on what the result looks like, right, in 12 years from now. There is a good chance, very good chance, that at the end we'll do something and we'll not do something. And this MDG was, was the same. And, and this drives me to answering your, your question. Companies and organizations, they cannot try to solve all problems because when you start trying to solve everything, at the end you don't solve anything. So what is important is that you keep focus. And to get things real, you need to keep focus. So in my experience uh, at the UN, this was in, because when you go to a country in the sub-Saharan Africa or, or in Middle East, what do you need to do? You need to do everything. Uh, there is lack of education, health, every, but you need to start with something. So many times when you try to solve a billion problems, you come at the end, do not solving anything. And this for me is a risk uh, on the SDG. So what organizations need to do, my opinion, is that they need to see on the SDG what they really think that they can make a positive, impactful contribution and work towards that. If it's water and sanitation, let's work towards that. If it's gender equality, let's work toward that. Instead of trying, you know, to do everything and then at the end you don't do. So keep focus. And this is the only way for you to move the agenda forward. I mean, these are extraordinary ambitious goals and presumably both the scale of these partnerships and the and, and the, the speed is going to have to accelerate very significantly if we're going to oh. come close to meeting them. From your experience of seeing the MDGs and that, that those UN processes, I mean, what's what's needed and and how achievable are the are these goals? Uh, yeah, I think that um, if public and private sector join forces with real intent to change things, we can make a lot of progress. We can make a massive progress. But 12 years is tomorrow. It's absolutely tomorrow. We, uh, we <coughs> I think that we'll face, we will do a lot of things, but we'll face a lot of challenge. Like MDGs, we, we did a lot of progress, but we didn't solve everything because if we had solved, we don't need the SDGs, right? So we, we have already solved that. And most of them are basically a follow-up on what happened on the MDGs. Yeah. I mean, just, just to add on that and, 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 and try to give you a pers our perspective on this is that, you know, we're flooded with investment ideas, right? Yeah. And we've got to, we, you know, the question is then, so how do you pick and why and et cetera. So what we do is we, we our focus is not on a particular sector. You could say we invest in every sector, but we actually don't invest based on sectors. We actually invest based on three themes, and we're looking for solutions that have a potential, if successful, to actually change the way economic development happens. One theme is providing you know, the poor with better access and service from the government. So the government is a core element in this, right? So that if we can find a way to help a government, which we're doing, for example, right now, to provide, you know, better um, uh, drinking water qual drinking water for those living in the, in the villages. Um, this is something we're doing in, in, in Bangladesh and, uh, and India right now. It's the it's the innovation, it could be a delivery innovation, it could be a de-risking financial innovation, it could be a financial innovation, but something where we're really looking at all the evidence of what's worked and what hasn't worked from aid, the billions of dollars of aid that have gone out the door in the past and saying, all right, is there another way of doing this? And if it's successful, what is the path to scale? So and that's like, for us, um, it's, we are looking at that, that lens, and then we're, the Indonesian example I gave you before around, we call it domestic resource mobilization. How can we find, be innovative in finding ways so that governments have more tax dollars that they can then spend on clean water and et cetera? Uh, the other is very much around bringing goods and services to the world's poorest, the last mile delivery problem, but it's not just delivery. So 
you know, it's, it's really having products that they can afford. We've done everything from um, backing pay-as-you-go models for, for energy so that people can actually, they can't afford, a, you know, a cook stove or they can't afford X, Y, and Z. So we're interested in credit models. It's not really about the product. It's about the solution. And we can apply that to many different things. Um, and obviously, you know, um, financial, financial services and mobile, mobile money and mobile banking is another big area. But we look at it because there are a lot of mobile money operators you can go into. This is not why we're doing it. We're looking at those whose product and solution could bank the unbanked, are focused either exclusively or at least partially on that and have deep roots in the, the poorest the poorest areas. So that's our focus. There's a number of places there where there's a really important role for technology and innovation and that clearly links to the kinds of oh. themes at the, at the conference today and that you know, will concern many of the audience. Ricardo, what would your, and we're getting towards the end of the session, so I'd like just a kind of a, a closing thought really in terms of what your advice would be for people in those sectors who are looking for what might be sort of transformative, what kinds of technologies and innovations or what people in those fields could do to try and unlock these partnerships and achieve those, those social goods? Yeah, I, I think that first on the private sector, you need to reassess your risk tolerance. Because if you really want to make impact on countries that need, you cannot come with your, I would say, European or North American mindset because it will not work on the first moment. On the government side, uh, uh, you, you need to understand that there is a massive workforce on the private sector that can drive things a, a lot. A third point is that there is a, a young generation, and that we can see here on the Web Summit, that is really excited about making positive change. And we can benefit from that. So that, that what we see a lot today is this drive and interest from people to create technology to help uh, water and sanitation and to connect. And technology is becoming more and more accessible. So you go to Africa countries and you know, you, you have challenges in all sorts, but everybody has a mobile a mobile phone, a mobile way of, of paying. And this is how they connect and how they do business. And this is the use of technology on this very last mile. So this is what I would say from my side. Any closing thought from you, sir? Uh, yeah, I mean, if I really look across our portfolio, most of it is tech enabled. And then the question is yeah. tech enabled for what, right? So because if you're looking at how to reach these people, whether it's the government providing services or companies reaching them with goods and services, the way to do it is tech enabled. And to be aware of, well, it's, it, it's not, it, it, the innovations are around using proven technology applied to local circumstances, right? So in India, turns out that the, we're gonna uh, we're, have to end, but you know, you gotta make, for one company we're in, you have to have the, the, the software that works both on a flip phone and on a smartphone. And most people have both, but when you wanna communicate them, you know, I don't know which one they're using at what time and what you're communicating, right? This is not, that's the, that's the applicability. That's the applicability. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Ricardo thank and Sarah. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.